This video starts with a discussion of properties of matter, and then I've decided that wasn't enough for one night, and so I've tacked on um, a discussion of some things with regard to units as well on the end. So with regard to properties of matter, all matter, whether it's pure mixture or anything, has certain properties, and we can look at various examples of those. Uh, matter, as we talked about earlier, is defined as having mass, so mass is a property of matter. Density, which is defined as mass per unit volume, is a property of matter. Uh, boiling point, flammability, and general chemical reactivity. Uh, the volume of a of the of amount of some substance or, or mixture is a property. Refractive index, that's kind of an esoteric one. That's just how much does it bend light when light goes through it. Uh, and physical state, so is it a gas, is it a solid, is it a solution, is it a liquid? So there are, uh, so let's just talk for a second about mixtures. Mixtures, because a mixture has a variable composition, mixtures will also have variable properties. In other words, we can't say that, that salt water has a particular melting point because it depends on what the concentration of the salt water is. And so if you've got a mixture, it, depending on the makeup of that mixture, that's going to vary the properties. Some other examples, uh, the density of a sugar so water solution will change uh, as it becomes more or less dilute. So if it's more concentrated, it'll be more dense. If it's less concentrated, it'll be less dense. Um, here's an example from uh, of reactivity. If you've got a concentrated solution of isopropyl alcohol in water, that is flammable. But if you have a dilute solution, uh, it's not. So again, the property of flammability changes depending on uh, the composition of the mixture. We're mostly going to concern ourselves with, with pure substances. And pure substances, as we talked about previously, are really defined in part by the fact uh, that they have fixed properties. But pure substance is always going to have the same melting point, boiling point under specified conditions and other physical properties as well. So we've got a couple different ways of classifying properties. Uh, the first one, which we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, um, is extensive versus intensive, but it is good to know these definitions. Uh, an extensive property is a property of a substance that depends on how much of it you've got. And so mass and volume are two classic um, examples of extensive properties. The more stuff you've got, the more mass there is, the more stuff you've got, the greater the volume there is. Intensive properties uh, are ones that are independent of the amount of substance. And so there, I guess, is a little bit of a mnemonic for you there. I-N, intensive is independent. And so, for example, the density uh, of a substance is an intensive property. The melting point of a substance is an intensive property. In general, its um, chemical properties are intensive. They are intrinsic to the substance itself, not uh, depending on how much of it you've got there. Um, so so those that's one way of classifying uh, extensive versus intensive. What we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of this section of the video is looking at physical properties versus chemical properties. And then we'll talk about physical changes versus chemical changes. And when you're trying to uh, decide which of those two thing, categories a thing falls into, you really want to just ask yourself what I would call the big question. And the big question is, are old substances being destroyed or trans or are there being or are old substances being destroyed or transformed into new substances, or is a particular substance retaining its identity? If if substances are being destroyed and transformed into new uh, substances, that indicates a chemical property or a chemical process. Um, but it, whereas if a, the identity of a substance is not changing, then that really is going to be associated with a physical process or a physical property. So let's look at this in a little bit more depth. Um, physical properties. Physical properties are properties that can be observed without destroying the substance or changing the identity of the substance. So that, that would be the answer to the big question being no. If the answer to the big question is no, then you're talking about physical properties or physical changes. So let's think about some physical properties. Density. We can measure, as, as we're doing in lab this week, dense, measure the density of a substance uh, without changing its identity. 
We can determine the melting point of a substance without changing its identity. We can uh, identify the color of a substance. Uh, we can see uh, what its ref refractive index is. All of these are properties that we can measure without changing uh, the identity of the substance. Uh, the mass, I've included a, uh, a, uh, an extensive property there. A chemical property of a substance is going to be something that you have to destroy it or transform it into something else in order to observe. And so the chemical properties of a substance can only be observed by transforming it into something else. Generally, we are talking about chemical reactivity and some of the specific forms that'll take that we'll see over the course of the year would be flammability. That's a chemical property. You have to burn <clears throat> gasoline in order to observe that it is flammable and, and convert it into something else. Reduction potentials, which we'll talk about at various points along the way. Uh, you have to either oxidize or reduce a metal in order to uh, in order to determine its reduction potential. Uh, the radioactive half-life of a particular, um, of a particular uh, radioactive element. You can only uh, determine its half-life by observing it as it is being, uh, as it's undergoing radioactive decay and turning into something else. Uh, similar logic goes for physical versus chemical changes. Again, if you're not if you have a process occurring which does not change the identity of anything, that's a physical process. If you have a process occurring in which uh, old substances are being converted into new substances, uh, that is a chemical process or a chemical change. Okay, a physical change does not change the identities of any substances involved. And so there are a lot of different physical changes that we can think about. If I freeze water, it is still water. It's just changed its physical state. Um, if I boil water, I'm not changing the identity of the water. Again, I'm simply changing its physical state from a liquid to a gas. If I mix, um, if I mix sand and salt together, um, I still have sand and salt. They retain their identities. If I dissolve salt in water, um, I still have salt and I have water. They retain their identities. If I uh, separate my mixture of sand and salt by dissolving the salt in water and filtering, or filtering away the sand, everything still retains its identity. If I separate salt water, the salt and the water, by boiling the water off and condensing it in a pure state in another container while the uh, salt residue stays behind, Again, I'm, I'm not changing the identity of anything. I'm simply using separation methods uh, to get them back apart, to, get a, to take a mixture and, and, and separate it into its component substances. Those are physical changes. A chemical change is always going to result in an old substance or substances being destroyed and a new substance or substances being formed. Uh, combustion of gasoline is a, a chemical process. I'm turning gasoline. I'm taking gasoline. I'm reacting it with oxygen in the air to form carbon dioxide and water. I am rusting. Uh, pure iron is reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere to form iron oxide. Old substances being destroyed, iron and oxygen. New substance being formed, iron oxide. Uh, if uh, electrolysis of water, if I take water and run an electrical current through it, I will get hydrogen gas being generated at one electrode, oxygen gas being generated at another. I'm destroying water and converting it into new substances, hydrogen and oxygen. So um, we can, one, one more slide that I would have put in here if I was just interested in overburdening you with slides would have been to say, we can take a particular substance and think about a physical change that it undergoes, and we can think about a chemical change that it undergoes, some of which may look or sound similar. If I take gasoline and I heat it up, um, but I don't, but in an atmosphere that contains no oxygen, it will boil, right? So just boiling gasoline, that is not a chemical process, that's a physical process. I still have all the same gasoline molecules, they're just going from the liquid state to the gaseous state. If I take gasoline and I put a match to it, it'll start burning. Now, 
it's kind of similar to boiling in that there's heat involved, but now I'm converting old substances into new substances. I've got a chemical reaction going on. Uh, so that's thinking about uh, physical and chemical changes. Let's move on now and talk a little bit about units. And there was a discussion of, of scientific units in the um, boot camp presentation. So I'm not going to spend much time on this particular slide. This just gives the seven uh, base units under what are, what's called the SI system, which is the International System of, of Scientific Units. We're really going to only over the course of this class course, concern ourselves with uh, the first six, mass, length, time, temperature, amount, and then uh, the amperes, the unit of electric current. Um, the metric prefixes, again, this is from uh, right out of the boot camp slides, and so I'm not going to spend much time on this either, just remind you what, which ones I have insisted that you need to have memorized. A G for giga means 10 to the ninth or 1 billion. A M for mega means 10 to the sixth or 1 million. K for kilo means 10 to the third or 1,000. Milli means one, 10 to the minus third, 1 1,000th. Micro means 10 to the minus sixth, 1 millionth. Nano means 10 to the minus ninth, uh, 1 billionth. There were two more metric prefixes that I told you you needed to know that don't come in this scale of three. So you notice it's 10 to the ninth, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the third, 10 to the minus third, 10 to the minus sixth, 10 to the minus ninth. Those two are the are deci, which means 10 to the minus one or one tenth, and centi, which is 10 to the minus two or one one hundredth. Um, why do you need to know that? Well, that's going to take us into our next discussion, which is a discussion of the uh, SI units and the and the scientifics that units that we use for volume. So let's talk for just a second about volume. Volume is not one of the base units in the SI system, but if you think about volume, it's when we think about volume, we're talking about three dimensional space, and therefore in terms of units, it's going to be related to to length cubed, right? So if you got one dimension, that's length. If you've got two dimensions, that's area. That would be length Q squared. Uh, and if you've got three dimensions, that gives you space or volume, and that would be length cubed. And so if you, if you think about what would the SI unit for volume be, well, since we're talking about length cubed and the SI unit for length is the meter, um, the SI unit for volume would be the cubic meter. And this will actually arise at some point in the course, although I can't think off the top of my head what it is, but I know that this comes up at some point, that, that the SI unit for volume is the cubic meter. The thing with the cubic meter is it's much larger than any volume that we would ever use in a laboratory and really much larger than any volume than you would ever use unless you were like in some production plant making vast quantities of things. Cubic meter is much more than the volume of your bathtub, for example. And so we, instead, we use a unit of volume called the liter. And the liter is defined as one cubic decimeter. So in other words, a cube, uh, each of whose sides is one decimeter long. And so um, it occurred to me to say, okay, let's practice looking, because this will help us do a little bit of dimensional analysis practice as well. If I put the question to you, so if the SI unit of volume is the cubic meter, but the unit that we're used to using is the liter, which is a cubic decimeter, how many liters are there in one cubic meter? Well, there are 10 decimeters in a meter, right? So you might be tempted to say that there are 10 liters in a cubic meter, but you'll be forgetting something. So let's just walk through this and let's do this dimensional analysis wise. Let's start with one cubic meter. So I asked how many liters are there in one cubic meter? Well, I am going to convert cubic meters into cubic decimeters, but here's an important thing to remember. When I do this, I, because there are, because I have meters, three times, that is meters cubed, I have to eliminate meters three times. So one decimeter is 10 to the minus one meters. 
I've got to do it again, and I've got to do it again. I've got to get rid of three meter units, which means I have to um, uh, divide by three meter units in the denominator and get decimeters into the numerator three times so that it would be decimeters cubed. This is just a basic fundamental thing that a lot of uh, students get hung up on and make mistakes on. If you're cubing, if you're doing a conversion in which you're squaring or cubing the unit, you also have to square or cube the conversion factor. And so now I've got cubic decimeter, I've got decimeters cubed in the numerator. And so I can now convert that to liters by saying one liter is equal to one cubic decimeter. So these three meters cancel out that meter cubed. These three decimeters are canceled out by that decimeter cube. And when I do that calculation, there are 10 to the third or a thousand liters in a cubic meter. So not 10, but a thousand. Okay, well, there's another unit of volume that we use, um, it, which is the cubic centimeter. And so now the question is, let's try this again. How many cubic centimeters are there in one liter? So we've defined the liter as being a cubic decimeter. If a centimeter is one one, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, corner cutting here, but if a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter and a decimeter is one tenth of a meter, it stands to reason that there are 10 centimeters in every decimeter. So I'll let you think about that for a second if you need to. But again, if there are 100 centimeters in a meter and 10 decimeters in a meter, then there are 10 centimeters for every decimeter. So if I start with a liter, and I, again, by definition, a liter is one cubic decimeter. I just got through saying there are 10 centimeters for every decimeter. I have to do this three times so that I'm getting rid of decimeters three times and putting centimeters into the numerator three times. And I get 10 to the third or 1,000 um, cubic centimeters. So there are 10 cubic decimeters or 10, I'm sorry, there are 1,000 cubic decimeters or 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. There are 1,000 cubic centimeters in a liter, which is also a cubic decimeter. Where I'm headed with all this, in t beyond just going through this to kind of talk you through, get you to think about how to do some of this dimensional analysis and conversion, is to ask the question, What's the relationship between a milliliter, which is another unit of volume that we will use very regularly, and a cubic centimeter? And so let's do that. Uh, let's do that conversion now. So I'm going to start with one cubic centimeter, and I'm going to calculate how many milliliters there are in a cubic centimeter. Well, we just got through in the previous slide figuring out uh, that there are 10 to the third cubic centimeters in one cubic decimeter. We know that the cubic decimeter is defined as one liter. And we know from our metric prefixes that one milliliter is equal to 10 to the minus third liters. Every quantity in the numerator is a one. In the denominator, I've got 10 to the third times 10 to the minus third, which is equal to one. Therefore, the whole thing comes out to one milliliter. And so, a lot of this has just been leading up to trying to point something out to you. A milliliter is equal to a cubic centimeter, and it's important to remember that and to always know that as you're working your way through chemistry because these are interchangeable units, and they'll come up all the time, and you'll need to just be able to, in your mind, interchange them and understand that a milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter. In fact, I've just gone on uh, Google Images uh, and pulled out a couple of pictures of syringes, and you'll see that whereas this one is giving it in milliliters, the 10 milliliter syringe. Here's an older version. They don't you don't see many syringes like this anymore, but this is giving it instead of in milliliters in cc, and cc simply means milli, uh, cubic centimeter. So this is a 60 milliliter or 60 cc syringe. This is a 10 milliliter or 10 cc syringe. And then this is just right out of your textbook, but just trying to get you to visualize this in a sort of three-dimensional way. The big thing here is a cubic meter. 
there are 10 decimeters in every meter, and so there are therefore 10 times 10 times 10 cubic decimeters in a cubic meter, or uh, 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. And then here's a tiny 1 1,000th 1, of the cubic decimeter, which is one cubic centimeter. And there are 1,000 of those. There are 1,000 cubic centimeters in a cubic decimeter. There are 1,000 milliliters in a liter. So it's a cubic decimeter and a liter are the same thing. A cubic centimeter and a milliliter are the same thing. A milliliter is a cube uh, that is one centimeter on each side. Okay, a couple other quick things to uh, talk about um, density. We've talked about density as a property. Uh, density is defined as mass per unit volume. And so in terms of units of density, we'll actually see various ones. And so I kind of wanted to acquaint you with all of them. First of all, again, the, the official SI unit, because the kilogram is the SI unit of mass and the meter is the SI unit of length, uh, the official unit for density in the SI system would be kilograms per cubic meter. We don't ever express it that way, but we use we do use grams per liter. And if you think about it for a second, grams per liter and kilograms per cubic meter are the same thing, because there are a thousand grams in a kilogram, and there are a thousand liters in a cubic meter. So grams per liter and kilograms per cubic meter are the same unit. We typically use grams per liter as a unit of density for gases. So for example, nitrogen gas has a density of about 1.2 grams per liter uh, at atmospheric pressure and room temperature. Oxygen gas has a density of about 1.3 grams per liter at um, atmospheric pressure and room temperature. So grams per liter is typically used as a unit of uh, density for gases. Um, however, if we're talking about solids and liquids, you wind up having like perhaps tens of thousands of grams per liter. And so that's not a really typical, that's not a really useful unit. And so we use grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter, which are the same thing, right? We just got through saying that cubic centimeters and milliliters are the same thing. And so typically for a solid, we'll talk about grams per cubic centimeter. For a liquid, we're talking about grams per milliliter, but these two units are interchangeable and you ought to be able to interchange them uh, in your mind. And then here's just another unit that could potentially be a unit of density, pounds per gallon. And anytime you have a unit in which has you have a mass in the numerator and a volume in the denominator, that's a legitimate uh, unit of density. Finally, here's a little mnemonic to help you remember uh, it's the heart. I love density. Density is equal to mass over volume. And we'll use this a lot over the course of the year in doing various calculations, either in this form or we can solve for mass. Mass is equal to density times volume. So if I know what volume of a particular liquid I've dispensed, what the density of that liquid is, I can calculate the mass. Uh, conversely, volume is equal to mass over density. If I know the mass that I need, and I know the density of the liquid, I can calculate the volume of that liquid that I need to dispense. All right, well, this is running a little long, and so let's just quickly get into temperature. This is an image right out of your textbook uh, showing by uh, in comparison the Kelvin scale, the Celsius scale, and the Fahrenheit scale. Of course, we use Fahrenheit in our everyday world, but we never use Fahrenheit in a chemistry laboratory. We only ever use Kelvin and Celsius and so I'm not going to require you, and I don't believe that the College Board ever requires you to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius, even though that's something that we learn to do at various points in our life. Rather, I'm just going to give you a quick little life lesson here because I had to get used to doing this, not only being a science teacher, but traveling back and forth between the U.S. and the U.K., which I used to do uh, in my research days. And that's just simply to remember two things. If you can remember two things, you can, you can get along well in life. There are nine Fahrenheit degrees for every five Celsius degrees, and 20 degrees Celsius is equal to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And so how does that help you? Well, if you're, walk, if you're thinking about what is the 25 degrees Celsius is, is used as a standard in chemistry. So what is that temperature actually in, in Fahrenheit? Well, if 20 degrees is 68 
and there are nine Fahrenheit degrees for every five Celsius degrees. To go from 20 to 25 would, would be going 68 plus nine is 77. So I actually do this in my mind. If I can peg it here, then I can tell myself, okay, 25 is 77 degrees, 30 is 86 degrees, 35 is 95 degrees, et cetera. And you can go the other way too. It's just a nice little helpful thing for me in just doing back of the envelope calculations in my mind between Celsius and Fahrenheit. What you do need to be able to do and do often in this course is Celsius to Kelvin conversions. Uh, and here are the conversions. Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273, which is actually 273.15, but because adding 273 to pretty much any Celsius temperature we're ever gonna see is gonna give you three sig figures, sig, three significant figures. It's not really necessary to add in the 0.15. Three significant figures is usually enough to do it just about any calculation. Uh, conversely, uh, degrees Celsius is equal to Kelvin's uh, minus 270. And so these are actually uh, tremendously important conversions that you need to get down and you need to be able to do. All right, I believe that's the end of the video. It is, and so now you will have some sort of QOD uh, assignment associated with this, and we'll talk to you later.